morning everyone, it's lovely to be here and the reading this morning is from Colossians 1 and I'm going to read the whole chapter so if you want to get your Bibles out and I'll put my glasses on so I can see. (laughs) Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy our brother to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace be to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that springs from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, minister of Christ. Oh, sorry, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told you of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all the power according to his glory. glorious glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Lord to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom the son he the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, or by making peace through his, through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm, not move from the hope held out in the gospel, This is the gospel that you heard about and that has been proclaimed to you, to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave to me to present you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labour, struggling with his energy which so powerfully works in me. Good morning, everyone. My name's uh, Pastor Michael, and uh, I'm at uh, Northreach Upper Ross. If you're familiar with Townsville at all, Upper Ross is an area of... uh, great need in Townsville. We have the largest housing commission areas, most indigenous people, and that's where Ruth and I have been for the last, well, February will be 17 years we've worked there, and uh, started the church in 2012, 
and uh, we'll celebrate our ninth year in February, so that's pretty exciting. And uh, we want to bring the greetings from everybody there. And uh, in March we'll be back and we're going to bring a number of people here and we'll uh, celebrate with you then. But in the meantime, let me pray and then we're going to jump into uh, some big ideas today. Lord, we, we give thanks for your word. We give thanks for its encouragement uh, to us. And uh, Lord, we pray as we think carefully about what, what you're calling us to become, who you're calling us to become. Lord, we be ready to hear. And Lord, we be ready for next year. Lord, we face some trials this year for sure, uh, Lord, but we're ready to move forward into next year. And uh, pray that your word would encourage us in that today. Amen. Now, uh, what I want to do this morning, with your permission, is really going to look at some big ideas, right? What are some... Whoop, we can move that out of the way. Great. There we go. Maybe. Let's start. There we go. Some big ideas. We're going we're gonna to kind of fly over the New Testament today <clears throat> and look at four big themes today. And, and hopefully this will encourage you. As we think about what Paul is saying here at the end of uh, chapter 1, he's calling us to be mature. He's calling us to, to grow up, to not be where we are now, but to be further along. So in 365 days, if I get the privilege of coming back here, and, and I hope that you would find me having grown. Now we're thankful for where God has brought us to, for sure, but we know He's not going to leave us here. And He expects us, He encourages us, Paul is encouraging us here, to continue to grow, to be fully mature, to not be satisfied with, well, I've gotten so far in my Christian life, and that's as far as I can go. But it's not true. There is, there is more. And as we look through this today, uh, this morning, hopefully this will encourage you. We to think about where you are, and maybe these areas we're going to talk about today, will encourage you to think about some things you could grow into. So we're fully mature. But sometimes the objection is, you know, that, well, I'm saved by grace, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, so that's as far as I need to go. I've been saved. I wait for heaven, right? But Jesus says, I have something for you now, right? I want you to live now on this place. He's put us here for his good purpose. Dallas Willard puts it this way for us. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. Effort is an action. Grace, you know, does not... Uh, just have to do with forgiveness of sins alone. And we'll see that as we, as we go forward here. And again, Paul, he says here, I strenuously contend with all the energy uh, Christ so powerfully works in me. So Paul understood grace. He understood that he couldn't earn God's grace. He knew that. But he also knew that God's grace was compelling him further along. He wasn't satisfied with where he was, and he wanted to keep moving forward, and he wanted the church in Colossae and us as well in the 21st century to continue to move forward in all that Christ had for us. Not be satisfied with where we are. Thankful, God has got us this far, but we're not going to stay here. We're going to keep moving forward. I think really in the New Testament there's probably four, there could be more, uh, signs of maturity. This is what we should be looking for in one another. And in ourselves, particularly, uh, uh, to know, am I mature, right? And the, one of the ways that happens is we, we kind of see it in each other. We encourage it in one another. Remember, the, the church is not just, we're not just individuals. We're a family together. And I really think about it in four ways. I think about missions as our foundation. Everything starts from missions, Discipleship then happens as people are reached and they begin to grow in Christ. And we'll see how that happens in a minute. But it's simultaneously, disciples aren't left on their own. Disciples are invited into a community, aren't they? And that's all of us. At some point, we were invited into the community, into God's family. But the goal doesn't stop with community and discipleship. The goal is worship, right? That is the ultimate goal of the church. But let's start with mission and we'll come back to uh, worship in a minute. I really look at mission in three ways. I think about personally, what is God calling me to do? How do I communicate the gospel 
to my family? How do I live it out in my decisions? How do I bring Christ into everything that I do and everywhere that I go? I think about local. How do all of us together in this room and, and the people in Upper Ross and the people at Northreach and the people in Ingham, how do we together carry out God's mission to reach the people of North Queensland? This is what we're called to do. And then ultimately some of us are going to be called overseas. God's mission goes out even wider into the world. And so we can think about that. But today I want to just look at the personal side of things. Let's come back to this idea here of grace that we're saved by through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Christ has done everything that we need on the cross, hasn't he? His blood has been shed for us. Our sins have been forgiven. We have been reconciled. This has all happened not because of us, but because of him. But because of what he's done, right, we are now God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. He's calling us to something in this life that's more than just about us. And it's not stopping at, well, I've been saved. I've put my hand up in a service and I said, yes, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. He's calling us to more, isn't he? Isn't that what Paul's saying here in Ephesians 2? Calling us to more and to, to know that God is at work in our lives. God has placed you here for these people in this town, in this city, to do good works, individually and as a church. And He's prepared that in advance. God isn't surprised when you wake up tomorrow and start doing the things that He's called you to do. He knew that you would. Because He's empowered you to do that. And the question is, do we trust that in your personal mission? Are you growing in that? What you did this year, I hope it's better for you next year, right? I hope your personal mission grows. It shouldn't shrink. It should, it should expand. It should grow. And that's what we should be looking for. Lord, what are the opportunities in 2021 for me? Who can I reach out? Who can I encourage? Now, sometimes we can't always share the gospel, but guess what? We can share kindness to people. We can give encouragement to people, and eventually the door will open for the gospel. Martin Luther summed up this very well for us. He says, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. Right? You've been not saved by your good works. Christ has done that for us. But our neighbors out here, they need to know that. They need to know how good God is. They, know, they need to know how much God loves and cares for them. And so I think Luther sums up the gospel very well for us here. That we, we need to be doing good for our community. And everywhere we go and decisions that we make. Again, we bring Christ everywhere we go to help us to make those good decisions. Looking for those opportunities to light candles in dark places. But our personal mission is, is not the end. It's not the final goal. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Mission exists because worship doesn't. Now I see the people here, and I assume there's people in some other churches today, but it just in Charters Towers, think about thousands of people that aren't worshiping, that don't know Christ, don't know how much God loves them. We have mission then. We want to reach them. We want them to know. And then we go to Charters Towers, and we go to Townsville, and then we go further and further out. This is why we have mission. Because people are not worshiping Christ. They do not yet know Him. And so this is the goal of the church. We want people to worship Christ. This is where we're going. So, but there, and there will be a day when mission ends. And we'll look at that in a minute. Second sign of maturity then is your, your personal mission. But then also your personal development. How do you grow in yourself? Right? The things you're doing out there. But you've got to grow inside as well. And that's really discipleship, and that's really what discipleship is about. And I've listed four, and there's lots more. Discipleship includes your prayer time, your Bible reading, using your spiritual gifts, and sharing your faith. I want to look today just at Bible reading. We could spend a couple hours looking at these others, but I know we don't have much time, so we're going to just look at Bible reading today. One that's very important to me personally, and I hope for you as well. A couple of facts about Bible reading in Australia is that uh, less than half of all Australians, 45% own a Bible. 
Now, a hundred years ago, nearly everybody owned a Bible in Australia. Now we're down to less than half. And if you're under uh, 40, only a third own a Bible. It's a good ministry for us, a good opportunity for us to make sure that people have God's Word in their hands. Sydney's the uh, Bible reading capital, uh, where people are more, much more likely than in Darwin to, uh, to read the Bible. I couldn't necessarily tell you why, maybe you'd know the answer. Uh, Richmond is the uh, best Bible reading suburb, at least for online reading, and let residents of Warrnambool uh, read the Bible online the most, uh, for the most amount of time. And the Sermon on the Mount, this is interesting and maybe worth a discussion later, is uh, Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount, is the most accessed Bible passage online. Don't know why. Good question. So, but for us, for the follower of Jesus, uh, we, we should really be picking up our Bible, shouldn't we? Right? We really don't have any reason not to. We don't have it. Now, a friend of mine, her grandfather, he'd been a, a Presbyterian pastor for over 40 years. He's in a retirement home, and every day he's still reading his Bible for two and three hours every day. And people would say to him, why? You, you, you've been reading it all your life. you preached it all your life. That's enough. He said, no, no, I don't want to be embarrassed when I get to heaven because I don't know who Jesus is. Right? He felt that strongly that he continued to know, need to know who Jesus was, that he hadn't gotten to the bottom of it. And so he continued to read his Bible. And we see in the Great Commission, fairly familiar to us, again, we tie our discipleship to our mission, and we see Jesus saying to us, uh, those who we reach to teach them everything I have commanded you. But how can we teach them if we don't know it ourselves? You see? If we don't know Jesus' life, if we don't know what He's commanded, it becomes very difficult for us then to say to people out there, here's what Jesus is calling you to do. If I don't know it and believe it and do it myself. And the way to do that is got to pick up the book. I always say to our guys and and uh, we put a lot of emphasis on Bible reading at Northridge Upper Ross. If you miss a day, that happens. We just don't miss two days, right? And, and our guys are really good at Bible reading. And we talk about it a lot and work on it a lot. I want to encourage you if, you, if you don't have a Bible or you don't have a Bible reading plan, talk to Pastor Daniel, and I'm sure he can set that up for you. Very important. Sometimes you're going to read it and you're going to get stuck on things, but don't let that worry you. Just keep working on it. God will reveal himself to you. And I love this in Jeremiah. He says here, when, when, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. And I hope for you, sometimes uh, Bible reading at times, you think, well, I've read this before. I'm familiar with this. It seems a bit dry. But for Jeremiah, he says, I ate them. I was hungry for God's word. And they were my heart's delight. I wonder for you if that's how you're feeling uh, when you're thinking about your Bible reading. Are you hungry for God's Word? Is it delighting your heart? You think about the two men on the road to Emmaus and Jesus appears to them and they're, they're walking and, and then when Jesus takes them through the Old Testament and then He disappears and they said, didn't our hearts burn when He spoke to us? I wonder as you're reading the Gospels if that's how you feel. Do your heart, does your heart burn as you read the Gospels? Maybe it's time to read them again with fresh fresh energy. So we think about your own discipleship, but of course, again, discipleship isn't done on its own. We have community and we live in community. And this is, this is the, the biggest challenge, I think, for uh, the disciple and for our maturity is how we get along and how do we live together. That, that is often the most difficult part of church life, isn't it? How do we do that? I think in community, and there's more, and I've given you two here, there's really two parts that are very important. One is hospitality, and we'll talk about that as we go. And then the gathering, which is our regularly getting together, whether it's in our Bible studies, whether it's coming on Sunday, and whether it's working together in the community. Very important. But let's talk about hospitality. How can we grow in hospitality? Now, some of you have a gift of hospitality, right? That's a gift that God has given you. And you are able to bring people into your homes or at church and you, and you can lavish love on them. 
with your ability to entertain and to cook and do all these things to make people comfortable. Some of us don't have that gift, but Paul calls us to it anyway. Right? Familiar passage in Romans 12, and he says here, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. And then he ends this all with where does this come from? Practice hospitality. Because hospitality is a reflection of love, isn't it? It's a reflection of love. How we invite people in. Now in Paul's culture, and Jesus' culture, that was one of the highest values was hospitality. The idea that you would invite strangers into your home. People who had been on the road traveling. The road in the first century was often dangerous and difficult. And so you would try to create space for people to feel safe and comfortable. But we can do the same thing here. As people come here and as people come to, to our different churches, we want them to feel comfortable. We want them to feel welcome. Now this fellow in the picture, his name is uh, Shamar. And uh, in 2011, Shamar uh, was the worship pastor at the Friendly Welcome Baptist Church in Mississippi and uh, Shamar decided that he would bring his taser to church because he thought he was going to get fired as the worship pastor. Now the elders of the church decided to bring their knives, right? Because they knew that Shamar was going to cause him trouble. And sure enough there was trouble and as the meeting progressed uh, Shamar tasered the pastor and one of the elders stabbed uh, Shamar's mother, right? And an all-out brawl ensued in this church and the police came and arrested everybody. Now it's kind of a joke about it because it's kind of crazy, right? That people would bring their taser to church. Do you feel necessary to do that? And I wonder though if sometimes we don't bring uh, a metaphorical taser to church. We've had it with somebody or the pastor or whoever and we're going to let them have it, right? Things aren't going the way I think they should, and I'm going to be the one to tell them. I'm going to let them have it, right? Couldn't be more opposite of what Paul has just told us in Romans 12, right? Love one another. Bear up with one another. But so often in the life of the church, in the life of the community, it's where we find ourselves. In conflict, in difficulty, because we've lost sight of what it means. So maybe this year, think about, well, how can I grow in my love for my community? How can I set aside things that maybe I thought were important so that other people can be more important? This is the sign of maturity of the disciple. This is the sign of maturity of the community that is able to set things aside for the good and the best interests of everyone else. So maybe we've got to leave our tasers at home and bring our love instead. And, and hospitality then is a, is a hinge that opens doors to community and mission. As we uh, care for others, as we love others, as we love one another, naturally that flows out. That love is going to flow out of here. And people are going to be drawn to it. We think about our family and our friends that, that aren't here today and that live in the community. It is hard at times. It's rough. The families that we work with, Ruth and I, they really struggle. It is a dog-eat-dog -dog place. You know, it's, it's hard. And so what we find is as people are welcomed in and people are treated with respect and care, they just naturally respond to that because they don't get any of it in their own families and community. So for us, then, hospitality can be that door that opens uh, people's hearts. So we want to we want to do that, or or a key that unlocks things. That's why I think Paul includes it here in this section of Romans 12 because it's so important, and we can easily neglect that as we carry our own agendas at times, things that we think the community should be doing and saying, and uh, sometimes we need to set those aside for the greater good. The last thing here, the 
disciple is, uh, wants to grow in and, and be maturing in his worship. And you think, well, I, I turn up on Sunday and isn't that enough? But it's not. Being faithful is important, but being fruitful is just as important. And we can be fruitful in our worship. And let's take a look at that. Again, Paul in Romans 12 here, he gives us this picture of worship. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to do what? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now it is important that you come. And we want you to come to church. As a pastor, that's important to us. But that's only half the story because Paul says here, offer your bodies. The idea here isn't, well, I'm here, but it's all of you. It's all of you. Your time, your talent, your treasure, your dreams and your ambitions, you lay on God's altar. That, then, we can please God because we're surrendering to Him. We're giving Him everything. Now our worship, our hearts are now inclined to Him. That is true and proper worship. And as you read through uh, the rest of Romans 12 and the little bit that we've looked at, then the church really begins to function. The heartbeat of the church really begins to go because we've understood what worship really is. is acknowledging His greatness and our small place in it. Our surrender to Him. And when the church can do that together, that's a very powerful force for good in the world. But Jesus warns us, doesn't He? He says, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right. And he's talking to religious people here. When he prophesied about you, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, and their teachings are merely human rules. This is a trap that we can fall into, isn't it? Oh, we, we turn up. My body is here, but my heart is somewhere else. My heart is somewhere else. And, and so this is the challenge for the disciple who's maturing is to, is to bring all of yourself. Every time we gather, that is not easy to do. But it's a sign of maturity. It's a sign that says, Lord, I surrender to you continuously continuously and that's that's a big challenge but it's the that's what we're trying to get ourselves to isn't it and through God's power and spirit we will the bar is high for sure but he wouldn't give that to us if it wasn't possible so take take Paul's encouragement to present yourselves present your bodies and then take Jesus warning to not let your hearts become hard or far from him and then, of course, when we think about mission, we think about Revelation 7. Mission is finished. The door is closed. Right? That door is, is closed. No longer will people be allowed in. But what has happened is that mission has succeeded. God's plan has worked. That after I looked, John says, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is the ultimate expression of the church is that we are gathered around God's throne in worship because, all of, he, because of all that He has accomplished. He has used us in His mission to reach all people everywhere. I think that's pretty exciting. When I read this, I get very excited because I know that even though it seems hard at times and I'm talking to people about Jesus and they, they just don't seem to be interested. But I know that God will succeed. I know that God's mission will be fulfilled. I know that. And so that encouraged me to, to keep going. To not give up. To know the victory has been won. I wonder if you're feeling that way today as we start out on this new year of 2021. Of course, we'll never speak of 2020 again because of the way it turned out for us. But this year, coming ahead, let's, let's really think uh, about how we can reach more people. 
and those people can join us around the throne of Christ. How good would that be? As we pray, as we care, as we share, as we worship together, how good would that be? Big themes, big call for us. It's not easy. We're going we're to leave here today and it's easy to go, well, next year, some, some other time, right? I got, I've got a young man at the moment who keeps, he's, well, I want to follow Christ, but I'll, I'll do it later, right? But there is no later. There's now. This is what we're called to and this is what the New Testament is calling for us. So again, thinking about worship now, again, worship and mission are connected, right? Mission isn't the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. But as we gather, as we recognize who God is, as we grow in that, we see Christ's work, it leads us back to mission, right? It leads us back to mission. We're not going to wait for people to turn up here on a Sunday. We're going to be out there for the next six days and we're going to be encouraging people. We're going to be praying for people. And we're going to be sharing with people about who Christ is. Right? And that leads us back into the circle, doesn't it? And that's how I tend to think about it. You might have other ways of thinking about it, and that's perfectly good. But for me, this is how I think about it and where we want to go. And I try to keep it pretty simple. Right? I don't try to make it too complicated. Pretty simple. I want, to, I want to share my faith. I want to bring Christ with me everywhere I go. Uh, I want to be a disciple who reads the Bible, who prays, uses my gifts that God has given me. And I want to be part of a community that's growing, that God's uh, heart is beating in. And I want to worship with everything that I have. I want to surrender my life continuously to Christ. These are the signs of maturity. Now, I know I have a long way to go, and I'm really looking forward to next year, leaving this one behind and saying, okay, God, how can you help me to grow in these areas? There is so much for Him to do. I, I want to be like Christ, but I look at where I am and I've got far to go. But I know God is working in me and I'm praying that He's working in you as well. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we, we come and, and uh, we acknowledge, uh, Lord, what You've done for us. The cross, the resurrection, forgiveness of sins, an empty tomb, new life promise, sin, death, and the devil defeated. And Lord, we are thankful for those things. But Lord, we want to be shaped in the image of your Son. Lord, where we are, we are thankful. But Lord, please do not leave us here. Help us to continue to grow. Help us to read your book every day. But we pray for that. We pray for uh, concentration, reminders, Lord, alarms that go off when we haven't so we can know who you really are. But we pray for the church. We pray for the people here that our love would grow, that this would be a sign that you're present in and with us, that the love we had last year will pale in comparison to the love we have for you in the year to come. It will continue to grow. And Lord, we pray for Charters Towers, Lord. We pray for the thousands that are not here today. Lord, that are far from You, far from worshiping You, acknowledging You. We know, Lord, in the end, every knee will bow. But Lord, we want people to come willingly at this point. And we know a door will close at some time. We, we pray, Lord, that their words stay open long enough so more people would come to know You in this city. Pray for Pastor Daniel and everyone here today. Lord, a blessing on the year ahead. May it be a great year for missions in this city. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much.